Hey everyone, welcome to Simplexity, where we simplify the complexities of life and add a little curiosity and contemplation to meaningful and sometimes difficult conversations. I'm your host, Allison Stoner. Human language has a tragic flaw. Words, in their earnest attempt to describe reality, immediately compromise and undermine it because no particular mono or polysyllabic noise can convey the complexity of our thoughts, feelings, and experiences. The constitution of words, in some respect, is merely whatever meaning we assign them individually and collectively, making them symbols of the real thing at best. Today, we're discussing a word that yields, wait for it, 25 billion 270 million search results in 0.75 seconds on Google. Any guesses what the word is? Love. L-O-V-E. Whether you look to the Greeks to categorize love by their six varieties or have a neurobiologist show you an active caudate nucleus and ventral tegmental area in the brain of a person falling in love, or you cross-analyze our cultural myths and romantic fantasies that we circulate in the creative arts, you won't find one word or way that defines it in totality, nor will you find a person, place, or thing outside of love's reach or influence. By some definitions, love is interchangeable with the literal force and substance of all matter and universal creation, as well as the glue holding it together. For humankind, it's a unique evolutionary bonding agent and social phenomenon that can inspire virtue, commitment, and pleasure just as swiftly as mania, obsession, and codependency. At its most basic... Love encompasses core psychological needs like belonging, feeling known, seen, and accepted, and forming secure attachments for healthy development and well-being. Yet, we are born into a human family and world still trying to recover from the imperfections and wounds caused and inherited through previous generations, incompetent structures that we've built, and narrow rules we've outlined. For something that's supposed to be as simple as swiping right or left, love becomes downright complicated, misunderstood, abused, addictive. And wherever there's a deficiency or confusion or excess, don't think advertisers won't capitalize on it. The diet, cosmetic, porn, self-help, and online dating industries promise to fill many love-shaped voids in us. And we have a lot of assumptions about falling in love and breaking up that cause unnecessary pain and turmoil. And today, we'll shift into a wiser paradigm, whether we're looking for a mate, celebrating singleness, or contemplating separation. Maybe you need to release an old relationship. And by the way, separation doesn't have to be limited to traditional monogamous romantic encounters. This could mean stepping away from a community of friends, moving cities and jobs, really anything in life that has a beginning, middle, and end that we can approach consciously. So whether you're recently smitten, heartbroken, or ambivalent, I have a special treat for you. We have Catherine Woodward Thomas with us, the New York Times bestselling author of Calling in the One, Seven Weeks to Attract the Love of Your Life, as well as Conscious Uncoupling, Five Steps to Living Happily Even After. She is a licensed marriage and family therapist and teacher to thousands from all corners of the world on relationships, partnerships, and tapping into our human potential. And she's going to help us make 2020 the best year to love and to be loved. Thank you, Catherine. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I love that intention. Mm, Beautiful. So you are a veteran and and pioneer in your field by now. And you had many years in private practice before stepping onto the public stage. Thank you for your service, by the way. Mm -hmm. What led you to focus your efforts on this topic of love and relationships in particular oh it was my biggest wounding and my oh it was so painful love was so painful for me for so many decades Mm. um i came from just a very kind of tumultuous 
a traumatic family. One, my mother was in and out of several marriages. I lost contact with my father. Um, their divorce was quite contentious. Mm -hmm. So it was um, it was wonderful for my soul's growth mm -hmm. because uh, I, of course, grew up with a, a lot of predictable toxic patterns. I was kind of a mm -hmm. poster child for what can happen mm -hmm. when the divorce goes bad. You know, I was just a, a, a troubled kid. And fortunately, though, I had the grace of having a spiritual awakening at the mm -hmm. same time all that was going on. But um, and I just had this sense that there was something larger than myself, and it, it kept me um, safe through those years. Uh, but I had a lot of difficulty in relationships. I didn't feel loved in my family. Mm. I didn't love myself. Um, and it was a grace to know that life loved me. So that wow. was, I really think, I think my future self coming back and kind of saying, here we go. This is, I'm going to give you something that mm. has you survived. Because I'm not sure I would have survived my youth, really. But relationships were the biggest challenge for me. I was mm -hmm. always an artist and creative, and so I found a way to, to turn my pain into creativity, exactly. but in and out of really destructive relationships. And it was painful because, of course, from my childhood, the one thing I wanted more than anything was to be loved. But I'll tell you, I did some, I did some, some really smart things. I made a decision to, to be a lover, like if love wasn't coming to me, then I was going to find a way to bring love to the world. Mm. And I kept finding my way to love. I took love on as an ethic. Love was what was missing. Mm. And instead of like looking around for it, I just, and I couldn't really love myself, but I could love other people. Mm. So I started doing a lot of service and I started to, you know, even ask life, what can I do to bring more love into the world? And I would mm. follow my intuition. And I think that that was really what ended up saving me. But I, I did time in the 12-step program and therapy, all sorts of things. Things didn't really radically change for me in my life until I, under, I understood about deliberate intention hmm. and actually taking a stand for a life that had nothing to do with the past and that was a complete departure, like just you know, setting an intention to have happy love, healthy love, no matter what had gone on in my past, no matter mm. what the patterns, even no matter that I had no idea what that even looked like. Right. Just taking that stand and kind of putting my stake in the ground. And instead of trying to sort myself out by going back into the past over and over again, because at that time I was a therapist, like I knew my issues inside and out, like I know a lot of people know already that we're right. codependent, that we have low self-esteem, we don't believe in ourselves or whatever the issues are. Mm -hmm. But it's when you take a stand for a future that's not going to happen unless you claim it and you start organizing around that future and in particular, who would I need to be in order to manifest that future? Wow. And you start really listening to your intuitive knowing to find your way to that future one step at a time. Right. That's really where things began to change for me. And you're no longer reacting to the world around you as the victim, but finally in the driver's seat as well. Well, I love that you're saying that, Allison, because I think that giving up victimization is the entrance to having a creative life. Hmm. And that when we're stuck in victimization, now, it, it, it's normally because we have been really ill-treated. Something happened and we were victimized. We're not, I don't believe that we're responsible for what happened to us as children, hmm. for the bad uh, judgment of our caregivers or for the traumas of life. We didn't cause that. But if you look at the patterns, we did. we have been covertly causing the patterns to repeat itself over and over again. The unavailability of the, the whole married men triangulation mm -hmm. really came from my father not being available. And why he wasn't available is partially because he got remarried to a woman who this was back in the 60s. And, uh, and she wanted nothing to do with me because she was offended he'd been married and had a child before he met her. Mm -hmm. So she forbid me in their home. Now, this is before people understood. So I'll give her, you know, a bit of understanding she was young she didn't know any better it's but gracious. she was and she was just you know trying to make her marriage work mm -hmm. but it took my father out of my life mm -hmm. and I and so for years I was I was pulling in these unavailable dramas that were kind of the central focus of my life so how do we how do we not play those patterns out anymore right and we'll 
definitely get into that quite specifically because your work has afforded the opportunity for people to see it laid out in clear-cut processes so they don't have to try to check inside with themselves and figure out their own roadmap. And I really appreciate that you offer it so generously to people and with such um, delicateness because we do have to tread lightly around matters of the heart. (laughs) Before we dive into Mm -hmm. each book, I would love to identify and debunk some of the main societal myths we have around love that have been hurting our love lives. Can you speak to, you know, some of the ideas you've shared that revolve around seeing relationships that end as failure or whatever myths you see destroying unions? I think the biggest myth that we're all kind of impacted by is this happily ever after. Hmm. And what happens is because happily ever after is kind of a a given for us as the goal of love um, is that when a relationship ends before somebody dies, we just assume it's a failure. Mm. And so we end up feeling a great sense of shame and embarrassment, like social embarrassment very often about that. Because shame is, is, is guilt is when we kind of violate our own internal code of honor or whatever our morality is or our our ethics are. But shame is when we feel like we've violated the code of expectations from others, what society expects from us, what we even expected, you know, what our Mm. parents expected or our friends. So we're, we're kind of cloaked in a sense of shame. And I think it's because of that that we never really learned how to do breakups well. Hmm. But the truth is, is that, and I, I learned that because when my first marriage was was ending, even though it felt like the right thing and it, it felt like we were doing it in a way that was really an integrity and aligned with our deeper ethics, I, I felt humiliated and ashamed about that. But I think that uh, I, I it, it motivated me to go back and to start to research, like, what's thinking me? Like, whose thought is that? Whose goal is that? You know, I like to do that when we are holding ourselves to accountable to something Mm -hmm. at some point to just stop and say, wait a minute, who wrote this rule? And do I actually agree with it? Mm. So I started to research it a little bit. And I just discovered that Happily Ever After was only created 400 years ago. Really? In Venice, Italy, at a time when Mm -hmm. the the people in in Venice, Italy, most of them lived in dire poverty. And there was a a real, you know, if you you look at the happily ever after myth, there's always upward mobility. You know, a commoner marries a noble person, and they all live happily ever after. Well, in Venice, Italy, at the time that these stories were created, there was a rule on the books, there was a law that forbid a noble person to marry a commoner. Mm -hmm. And there was no way out of poverty. If you were born into poverty, you were going to live your whole life in poverty. Plus, the lifespan was less than 40 years of age, Mm. and half the children were dying before the age of 16. Mm. So that's the cultural context. So I like to look at these assumptions that we have inside of a cultural context, because all of these memes, they're really of the time that they were created. Yes. Mm -hmm. And we have a very different context than people who were born 400 years ago in Venice, Italy. What the new norm is now is serial monogamy. I'm Mm. not promoting that. I'm not you know, saying whether I think that's good or bad. It just is what's so. And most of us are slated to have two to three significant relationships in our lifetime. So it's very important that we learn now how to engage a separation right. in a way that we're not quite biologically ready for because our bodies are still hardwired from a thousand years ago mm-hmm. where if you wandered away from your tribe, you were going to die. Mm. So we still have, we get flooded with fight or flight hormones. Mm-hmm. Rejection, it triggers the pain centers in the body as if somebody were actually physically hurting you. Wow. And a breakup uh, what's happening is is in the chemicals of the brain as a breakup is mimicking the same chemicals that are being released as if someone that you love is dying. 
So that's what's mm-hmm. happening on a biological level. Then we have the cultural level of this expectation. Mm-hmm. Plus, we have a legal system. I'm, I'm imagining we have people all over the world watching, mm-hmm. certainly in America and in a lot of countries. Most, so there are many more enlightened countries, mm-hmm. and countries that are much more enlightened than America. But in America, we've got a $50 billion a year industry around divorce. Ooh. So you have a lot of motivation. The plot thickens, <laughs> Charles Dickens. Ooh. You have a lot of motivation to keep this nasty. Mm. There's like a whole machinery. So even though family courts were created to try and take the pressure off, you know, when the family courts first started in the 70s in, in, in the United States, I think the book was like that thick. It just had a few things. It's oh, like this thick now. Sure. You know, it, it, you can't possibly get through it without an attorney. And if people mm. start going to war, you know, that's that's the direction everyone will go and, wow. and go through the kids' college fund, you know, faster than you can sneeze. Yes. And I am a product of divorce as well. And it was, um, you know, I'm not going to put my my parents on blast, um, but it was difficult. And I remember harboring some of those wounds from ruptured attachments. And I now get to see where they are showing up, not just in personal settings, but professional as well. Of course, everything that is programmed eventually (laughs) needs to be examined like you're saying if we want to free ourselves from it and at least have the option we can continue going but it would be nice to choose consciously and I wanted to just share another image of love that I (laughs) ironically heard from Will Smith so he referenced um, Krishnamurti explaining the desire and pleasure paradigm and that's where love is transactional. If you meet my needs, I love you. If you don't, I no longer love you. And his daughter, Willow, actually introduced him to the imagery of the gardener and flower, where, of course, a gardener wants the flower to become what it's designed to be, not what the gardener wants the flower to be. So it tends to it, it supports it blooming and blossoming and not demanding that it, you know, placate to the gardener's whim and or the needs of of our ego so that's just an imagery for love that supports honest growth and i think when i was reading your books um saw a glimpse into what what your processes allow for people to find is more freedom um, for all parties involved freedom to expand and to really fully realize who they are um, in their most authentic and honest form Mm -hmm. So we we spoke about where the myth of happily ever after came into play. But when we finally admit to ourselves that we really do want a partner and we're ready to connect or form a relationship, I think it's important to remember there's a writer, Mark Manson, and, and he shares that it's possible to fall in love with someone who doesn't treat us well, who makes us feel worse about ourselves, who doesn't hold the same respect for us as we do for them or who may have a dysfunctional life themselves and they threaten to kind of pull us underwater and and drown with them it's also possible to to fall in love with someone who has different ambitions and life goals that are contradictory to our own who you know holds philosophical beliefs or worldviews or whose path merely weaves in the opposite direction or just at an inopportune time Catherine, where do we even begin to call in the one, someone who's truly a good match Mm -hmm. for us? (laughs) Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it goes back to setting an intention Mm -hmm. for that, to know what it is that you're up to creating, because you can be attracted to someone, you can even have a deep, soulful connection with someone. Mm Um, But if you can see clearly that they're not a match for the vision and what you're standing to create in your life, then you would just see it as a holy encounter and you would not then have expectations that it would be more. A lot of it Mm -hmm. is that our our fantasies about relationship, our expectations Mm -hmm. uh, are what really... They kick in quickly. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think it's it's to so when we stand for a future. So if somebody's up to creating a soulmate relationship, then they might say something like my intention 
is to call in an amazing committed love with a trustworthy, inspiring, you know, king of a man or queen of a woman Mm -hmm. who is, uh, you know, benevolent and kind hearted, where we together are transforming the world in beautiful ways, Mm -hmm. right? That's very specific. So when you're out then and you're, and you're open and you're, and you're, and you're um, out putting yourself out there and you're showing up like that as the, as the one, because if you, if you have your A-list vision, immediately you're accountable now for being your A-list self. Mm. You know, we're not looking for someone who's fit and funny and, you know, solvent and we're just, you know, eating chocolates and deading right Right, and left. So, you know, you have to, you have to be your best self to call in your best relationship. So there's something about that future that begins to pull us to rise. But I think that we live then in integrity with that future, mm-hmm. and we're more committed to that future vision than to any one particular person. So there's the game of commitment and intentionality and integrity and alignment with the future you're up to. But there's also wearing everything kind of loosely so you're not getting attached prematurely anywhere. Okay. You have to see how someone's showing up. People always say, what's on your list? You know, what do you want? Right. Well, I want someone who's, you know, rich and educated mm-hmm. and super smart, spiritual. And I say, what about good character? what about someone who treats their parents well Mm. what about somebody who tips well what Mm. about somebody who is thoughtful and considerate and does some volunteer work for the community and thinks about others uh, you know in addition to themselves being blessed (laughs) yeah and I think it's important to recognize that instead of just focusing on our list for them we get to be the ones who become the person who would magnetize and and draw in the person we desire well, to be with. That's a big joke when people do the calling in the one process they get to the end they go, "Oh, I get it. Calling in the one was calling in me." Mm. <laughs> I get it. Uh, which is great because even if someone's listening and they themselves looking for an outward physical partner to connect with, they can still go through this process and transform. Yeah. Oh, I always say just do it because it, it will clear you to to not be in reaction to old pain mm-hmm. or to past suffering because you'll get out of that victimized position where you, then you just need to keep, you know, relationship away from you. And a mm-hmm. lot of us are, you know, once you have your heart broken, you really don't ever want to have to go through that experience again. Right. So what one of the things that I teach people is how to understand yourself as the source of your experience in a way that's objective and clear and, and probably somewhat uh, based upon your choices, your actions, how sure. you're showing up, as opposed to going into making yourself wrong or, you know, kind of explaining why you are the way you are because you have these issues, which Mm. is a lot of what we do. Well, I don't like myself, so I choose, you know, bad boys or whatever. If we're holding relationship like it's a thing to get, like it's an object, it's a problem. Because relationship is a dance of navigation. How we're going to make choices in how we're creating that relationship. You know, every relationship is a spectrum of possibilities. And we all know you can meet somebody who you feel is your soulmate at the deepest level and have it go into high drama and, you know, even higher hurt. Right. Where you're hurting each other. You get into a negative cycle with each other and you do not realize the higher potentials of that relationship. So when we're talking about calling in your soulmate, calling in the one, we're, we're assuming that we want a high level, a higher love. So it's not just the person. There's a lot of work to do. I had to learn a lot in order to not create toxic dynamics. So certainly I had to make better choices and have different expectations. But I also had to start showing up as a woman who valued herself Hmm. across the board. So Uh even though my father didn't demonstrate that he valued me, Mm -hmm. I had to stop being my father's daughter in a way. I had to Mm. stop allowing my father to define my identity. That's what, you know, psychologists call that individuation. Mm -hmm. You start to be your own person on your own terms. None of us, you know, are really our mother's daughters or sons. Mm. We really came in. So it's almost like you have to take the universe as your parent. You have to get that expanded in your consciousness. So a portion of what you're describing when we're beginning the process of you know, contemplating, calling in the one is becoming 
available. And I read, I think it was in in your books, or I watched everything under the sun on you. So it might have been during an interview. (laughs) Um, You listed three specific questions that Mm -hmm. we can ask ourselves about the process of becoming available to even find someone. Do you know those questions? Yes, I do. And and they were inspired by my, my friend Michael Beckwith. I always like oh, to give credit. Oh, yay, great. Um, so, but what it is, it's actually a visioning process. Uh, so we started with the intention that I just spoke. Mm-hmm. And so we might, as a daily practice, uh, add into our morning routine, uh, sitting just for, you know, a few minutes, closing your eyes and beginning to try and feel put your yourself somatically into that future as though that future were now. Just imagining that a miracle has happened and you now have that person and maybe you hear them singing in the shower in the next room. Oh, so sweet. <laughs> or maybe you smell the flowers that that person just brought for you mm-hmm. the night before. Um, you start to maybe f- imagine feeling them put their hand on the small of your back and kind of just melting into that sense of love. So you put it into your body and and all of your senses. And then you 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 say to yourself, okay, and you and really it's like a prayer to life. What is it that I gave up and let go of in order to manifest this vision? Hmm. So you're like literally asking the universe, okay, what would I need to let go of? You know, how do I need to transform in order to become who I would need to be Mm -hmm. in order for that future to happen and go well when it shows up? And I find that when we ask the universe a question like that, we just start to get intuitive knowing. We start to get guidance. When I was doing that first discovering it, it wasn't a big burning bush experience. It's Mm -hmm. just something like a hunch or a feeling or a knowing. So you're just sitting with the question, you know, please show me, universe, what would I need to let go of Mm. in order to allow this to come to me? The next question, and how will I need to now grow in order to prepare for it? So self-development. What what Exactly, development. What what skills and capacities am I going to need to now learn? How do I need to grow myself to get ready for this to come in. A lot of us will say, oh, I don't really know how to set boundaries or, oh, I'm, you know, I, I, ne- I can't, sp- I, I can never speak up for myself as though that were fixed. Right. Right. <laughs> as though there were like, you know, God made the mountains, God made the sun, God made you with no boundaries. Oh. Good luck with that. You know? <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and then the third question is, and what is my next step right now? Mm. What can I do to implement that and get into action? So, you know, it's good to understand yourself and where these patterns come from. But Werner Earhart reminds us that understanding is the booby prize. Mm. And transformation doesn't happen just exclusively in understanding. It's, It's a holistic process. When we understand, when we wake ourselves up to what's really true, when we begin acting from the truth and right. recognizing our power to co-create with life. Mm-hmm. We have a say in how our lives are going. Mm-hmm. And I think that those of us who are highly wounded have really got to um, find the way that our wounds then informs our gifts to give. Okay, we, t- we have to turn those wounds into wisdom. And very often we need to offer it to others, it's particularly if it was a big wounding. Mm -hmm. Because we need a very big playing field in order to pay that forward and Mm -hmm. become who we really can become now, not in spite of the wounds, but really because of them. Right. Right. Mm. And as you're saying, we cannot receive into our lives that which is inconsistent with our identity. So we absolutely will kill it off. Yeah. We'll make it into something else. It's the most important transformation that we can do. So the technology of transformation that I'm talking about is how do we create outside of the story? Right. How does Catherine create a happy, healthy, loving, mutually supportive, inspiring relationship when all I knew growing up and for all of my 20s and 30s was toxic dynamics? Yeah. Okay. Well, on that note, let's say we meet someone. (laughs) And now our brains and bodies are in drug-like euphoria, um, lighting up in the same places that they would if we won the lottery or used cocaine. (laughs) 
how can we know that we're falling in love versus just uh, lust or infatuation? I don't know that we're going to know that right away. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, you know, if you if you read books about love, like I, I really love the book, A General Theory of Love. Mm. Uh, they'll talk about that uh, that when, when we're going through a breakup, in particular, love withdrawal will mimic drug withdrawal. Mm. And uh, certainly Helen Fisher talks about this, or Sue Johnson talks about this, that, that chemically love is addictive, where we start to get addicted to somebody. So it is a form of drug. Mm. I don't know that that's bad. You know, I, I think that, you know, exercising or eating healthy, like all, all of our habits and things, we're, we're kind of designed to move into attachment. So it would make sense that kind of that addictive quality would come in because nature wants right. us to bond. Nature's kind of organized around us bonding. Conspiring. It is conspiring. In the bushes, it setting is. Us up. <laughs> I see you over there. <laughs> So, um, so, but I think that, you know, where the relationship is going to go, and we have to remember that to always hold on to our own capacity for autonomy, mm-hmm. no matter how much we want to merge, right. no matter how much we do merge, right. we have to have a strong enough self to come home to. And so that's going to be the bottom line. Is this person treating me well? Mm. When I tell them what I feel and need, do they actually care? Right. Doesn't mean that they're going to always meet my feelings and needs or drop everything that they're doing. But do they listen? Do they try and accommodate what I'm saying? Are they making, you know, certain changes to make sure that I feel safe? Mm -hmm. You know, so so it takes a lot of safety that we're weaving for each other to be able to navigate a true relationship. So it's more like, well, it's all kind of infatuation. And then can you then create a real relationship with that person? That's the real question. So one final question and about the coming together process, and then we'll take a quick break and talk about the reverse side of things. At what point in the development process of coming together, is it appropriate to have conversations about the future if we're sort of doused in these chemicals in our brains? When are we in a wise frame of mind? Well, I think it's important to kind of introduce what you're up to in your life early on. Mm. And you have to do it in a way where it's not like all about the other person. So you might say something like, look, I just need to let you know that I'm really up to in my life creating um, a a partnership that where we can build together Mm -hmm. and grow together and I'd like to you know that that that's what my intention is to create that in the next six months so I love what's happening here and uh, you might not be up to that but um so vulnerable but that's where I am and I needed to share that just to be in integrity with you Mm -hmm. and they're either going to say well good luck with that and let's (laughs) enjoy the moment and then you have a decision to make about that um or they're going to say you know I, I'm interested in that too. But I had one man um, before I met my actual uh, partner uh, who wasn't at all looking for that. And I shared in that way that was just really truthful and it didn't put pressure on him, but just told him who I was. And he came back to me a week later. He says, okay, I'm in. I like you. And uh, and I've thought about it and I'm in. If we mm. Now I ended up not choosing him because... <laughs> There were certain other things that weren't aligned, sure. but I, I was always touched that he came back and said that. Nice. You know, yeah. So I really wish that when we throw to the commercial, this beautiful, smooth jazz song could come on, like a nice love song. I don't know if that will be happening today, but you can uh, imagine that's the case. And if everyone listening, if you're beginning to make yourself available and go through the process cheers to you on this beautiful journey when we come back we will talk about the flip side if we are ready to consider separating from someone we love or um, consciously uncoupling as it were we'll be right back There are times when the world opens up Rolls a red carpet out and 
fills up your cup, I know. Oh, in my bones, I'm lucky in love. So lucky in love. Some bad news and then good news. Yesterday, my car was broken into, and interestingly, one of the only items stolen was my FabFitFun quarterly subscription box. It had just been delivered to my apartment, and I was bringing it with me for a weekend trip. Honestly, I couldn't even be mad, because in my head, I thought, they must understand why over one million women are obsessed with this box like me. And now they're going to get the real hookup, too, because you customize the items inside, and I had my top picks ready to go. You get 8 to 10 full-size items that range from beauty to home decor, apparel, jewelry, and more every season. And if you're indecisive, no worries because they'll surprise you and curate it for you. And they have really good taste. The Spring 2020 box has officially been revealed now and is on sale for a limited time. Retails at $49.99 but always has a value over $200. And Hello, if you use coupon code STONER, you get $10 off your first box at fabfitfun.com. So, add some fab, some fit, and some fun to your world. Save money, skip the lines, and get access to tons of premium content and other goodies with a FabFitFun subscription. Go to fabfitfun.com to see all the products, and then use code STONER to get $10 off your first box. Oh, and the good news... They graciously replaced my stolen box. So, shout out to the team who made that happen. Welcome back. We're here with Catherine Woodward Thomas. And by the way, if you heard that lovely song playing, that was Catherine singing. She just <laughs> released her album, and you can find it on all music streaming platforms. It's called What? Lucky in Love. How perfect. Okay, so there's a, a music artist switching gears that has written lyrics, um, things change, people change, feelings change too. Sometimes we outgrow each other and we stop caring the way we once did or our relationship spirals into a dead end and we start asking ourselves, should we stay or should we go? How do we assess a connection with someone um, and identify whether or not we ought to break up. Uh, you know, a lot of people were angry with me when I created Conscious Uncoupling, and then Gwyneth popped it into the lexicon, and it was all the talk, and I got some angry letters because people were, you know, angry at me for promoting breakups. Oh. Well, you know, people really have this happily ever after as kind of fact and mm. feel that it's ordained by life itself. But I think that I am actually an advocate for long-term love, and I'm an advocate for people finding their way back to each other. Mm -hmm. um, I think that people need to, uh, if they can, get support. It's very important that we understand the larger context that we're going from um, role-based relationships, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, even the 70s, you know, and to soul-based relationships. We expect a lot from each other. We want a lot from each other. And we're all growing as fast as we can to be who we need to be in order for relationships to realize their potentials. Mm -hmm. But sometimes we need support with that. So I always encourage people to go. Um, however, there are exceptions to that. If somebody that you're with is behaving in a very toxic way. Mm -hmm. You're with someone who has some real personality disorder things that are going on and they're very, um, you know, they're gaslighting you or they're kind of, you know, putting you down pretty much to try and control you. It feels like a dangerous relationship to be in. It's probably... Um, not a good relationship to try and navigate. Right. There are people you can't actually negotiate with, right. um, and you need to just grow yourself right out of that dynamic, out of that and relationship, run. and run. <laughs> um, and then if somebody is just not quite like that, but they actually don't really care anymore, they're not really willing to try to meet you. Um, what I do tell people is if you are able to express your disappointments and the other person really meets you and is trying to meet your needs and you see them making changes, 
try and stay open to those changes. See if you can meet them with some of your own. Mm. Um, a lot of people have done the conscious uncoupling process and then been able to reconcile mm. because in order to uncouple well, there are certain skills that one needs to develop that actually are relational skills that would actually have the relationship have gone better to begin with. So a lot mm. of people will do conscious uncoupling and say, wow, I really wish I had read this before mm -hmm. we separated because I might still be in the relationship. And the people who I find who don't really have trouble separating are people who are who are kind of fundamentally healthy. It's the, it's it's people like myself when I was younger uh, who who really have very dramatic and traumatic breakups because mm. we didn't really I didn't have and and so a lot of many people don't quite have the skills. We didn't have the necessary skills about how to self-soothe or how to take responsibility for our part without going into deep shame right. or how to even see the consciousness that we were in where we're making assumptions that look like the other person's feeling this way about us when actually they actually really weren't mm. or how to do repair, relational repair, all of these things that um, we touch on in conscious uncoupling that, that if you don't have those skills, relationships are going to be excruciatingly painful and you're going to either do damage to yourself or to the other person and certainly to your children if you have them. So I'm teaching those skills, which is why I can also promise that if you do the conscious uncoupling process with this person, that your next relationship is going to be much better. Mm. And I tell people your next relationship won't begin when you meet the next person, but with how you end with this one golden wisdom <laughs> so let's dive in then what is conscious uncoupling and what is the five-step process like a brief overview of each step because okay. i know people can get the, yeah. the book for themselves right so so the first one is, is the first step is finding emotional freedom because usually the people who are drawn to conscious uncoupling are, are in a place of deep emotional pain. They are ruminating a lot. They're uh, beating themselves up a lot. They're just, they have a broken heart. Mm. And they would do anything to be free. I mean, it's quite a horrible thing to have a broken heart. Uh, broken hearts are, are, are one of the worst things, the hardest things any of us will ever have to go through. And it's oh. weird because you have to... You have to walk around like everything's okay. You have to function. But, you know, your friends will give you a couple weeks and then they'll start going, get over it already, you know, mm. and they'll get kind of impatient with us. But a broken heart can be quite difficult to navigate. And so the first step is to meet people where they are. They're traumatized. They feel uh, rejected. Their life is inside out and upside down and unpredictable. They're terrified. They're angry. They want to hurt the one who's hurting them. Mm -hmm. You know, all of these like big overwhelming emotions. Yeah. A lot of that has to do with learning how to hold and contain your own feelings from a very deep center within you and even transforming the, 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 the fuel of all that negativity, those negative emotions into the energies of change, positive, productive change for mm -hmm. your life. So that's basically what we're doing in step one. Step two is to reclaim your power in your life. Mm -hmm. Power is always equal to responsibility. So what we're helping you to do in that step is to take responsibility for your part. Now that is not an easy thing to do no. because <laughs> we're very acutely aware of the wrong that has happened and we're probably right. People behave very badly in relationships and certainly at the end of love. So I say even if it's 97% the other person's fault, what's your 3%? Because you want to actually see how you colluded in the dynamic that happened that was so hurtful to you mm -hmm. in a way where you can then identify the amends that you would make to yourself moving forward, the thing you're never going to do again. Okay. I'm never going to skip over the red flags. I'm never going to give my power away to someone like that again to define who I am, to tell me what to do, to control my life. Mm. I'm always going to listen to my own deeper knowing. I'm mm -hmm. always going to ask the right questions. Right. So this is where you get to, to have hope of graduation. This could never happen again because I'm going to do this differently from now on. The, the third step, breaking the pattern and healing your heart, is to see how the breakup and the dynamics of that relationship are really 
inside of a larger story Mm -hmm. about the traumas that you endured as a child. So we look at that as in a holistic way, and I like to then identify what I call your source fracture wound. Okay. The original break in your heart. Mm. That your mother was a narcissist and, you know, it was always about her and you had to organize around her and you'd get punished if you presenced yourself. That's what I call a developmental trauma Mm -hmm. because, or that's what psychologists call a developmental trauma because it's a trauma that happened over and over again where you missed certain development because of that dynamic or you had some acute trauma. Your father left when you were five and never came back. And the meaning that you made of that, the story that you made of that. So we're looking to identify that story. So we, we name it. We look at what's really true. We identify the new ways of showing up that are going to graduate you from that story forever Mm. so that you really grow in your own consciousness, in your own self-awareness in a way that's going to make you much better at navigating intimate love moving forward. The fourth and fifth steps, now you're going back and you're now finally ready to deal with the other person. So we do all that inner work before we actually deal with the other person. Mm. So even if you're never going to see them again, a lot of times people think that conscious uncoupling is uh, something people have to do together, or it means that you're going to stay friends with that person. Not necessarily on both. It's just about being at peace. It's Mm. about being complete in a way that is conscious and leaves your heart whole. So that's for step four, becoming a love alchemist is about repairing, Hmm. which is going to be important if you have children. So how do you actually really clear that? Well, there are ways to really honestly clear it and complete it so that when you see your former partner, you're clean with them. Really? You can appreciate that person for the Hmm. gifts that they brought to you, for the growth that you gained, for the fact that it's your children's other parent. You know, so so we get to that in step four, and then step five is creating your happily, even after life, which is how do we set up structures for everyone to win Hmm. and not the attorneys, (laughs) right? Okay, I like the sound of this. How do we actually do that well so that the kids are good? You know, I think, you know, all of us who are here, I'm sure of it, your whole audience is such a beautiful part of this expanded global tribe of evolutionaries because we're all here to make our greatest contributions and Mm -hmm. to become who we came here to be. And we have to have a clean relational field for that. Right. We can't be bogged down with places where we're ruminating and resenting and hating on people and hating on ourselves for how we behaved and the mistakes we made. We have to turn it into something good, which is going to be growth and wisdom and paying the lessons forward and, you know, contributing our wisdom now to others. So uh, just a couple quick questions and these can be more spitfire i'm just thinking if someone is in the throes of um, uncoupling self-care is so important do you have just a short list of recommendations i know that the basics are the basics for a reason um, but any specific tools for people to cope i, I say keep it very very simple mm-hmm. um, one of the things you can do is make a list of things that you love um, maybe that's going out on a sailboat or Mm -hmm. maybe it's a good movie or maybe you love a great novel or you love chocolate chip cookies or Mm -hmm. whatever it's just once a day to do something that you love to nourish yourself but understand Mm -hmm. that you're in what um what what dating coach lauren francis calls romantic rehab right now Mm. you're you're in rehab you're in recovery for something Mm -hmm. you have to just move slow lower your expectations of Mm -hmm. yourself raise your level of self-care, prioritize being with other people who love you where you don't have to put on airs or perform or be anything other than yourself and where you are. And if we are not the ones going through it, but a loved one is, and we don't want to go the typical way that we see in society, which is almost fanning the flame of disdain, I think is how you worded it in your book, um, of sort of making fun of the ex or talking about how horrible of a person they are and how much better you are without them, which really doesn't help anyone heal ultimately. How can we be a better support system around people who are grieving that Yeah, loss? that soulmate to soul hate is really a, quite a shortcut to Ugh. try and disconnect. Yeah. Um, and, and what it does, though, is it devalues the whole experience of being with that person and it cuts 
off the opportunity for growth that you have because you're focused on them and you're blaming them. And I always like to say, if you're feeling that way, it's probably because they deserve it. Mm. But if you really start to look at your 3% clearly, you kind of have your hands full. Because you, that was the person you chose. So mm. we want you to choose better moving forward. We want you to make better decisions. We want you to show up more in integrity with the truth of who you are and in your power in all right. relationships moving forward. So that's where we want your attention, is not on diminishing the other person. And also on valuing the gains that you made in that relationship, the gifts of that relationship. Yeah. So it's a discipline because... It's almost like the, the see, I, I think it's nature's trick, that soulmate to soul hate, because it keeps us very bonded to the other person. Hate mm. is a very active thing. You're hating on somebody, it you are you. highly engaged. Mm-hmm. So it's just kind of the, the shadow side of love. It's not, it's not individuation. It's not authentic completion to hate on someone. As a matter of fact, it's kind of just a negative bond. You're replacing a positive bond with a negative bond. That's such a great and important point to remember. And if anyone watching and listening is going through this and they want more information, Mm -hmm. whether you're consciously uncoupling or you are calling in the one, you can find Catherine's books and music and the programs, workshops, events, um, all on your website, CatherineWoodwardThomas.com. Yes, thank you. Are there any other projects or last pieces of advice you intuitively feel you want to share with our community? We covered a lot of territory. Well, I think I'm very excited about where consciousness is moving right now. Mm. And I think we're really, you're you're picking up on it. I'm sure you're talking about it with others as well, this this transformation of identity Mm -hmm. that we're really engaging, um, really going down to the core and claiming the truth of who we are and designing yes. our lives from there. So so I'm doing new work I'm developing is called True Love Awakening. Mm. And it's about really catalyzing that high level radical transformation very quickly. So that's what 2020 Amazing. is really devoted to also for me. Well, we will be looking out for that. I know if anyone wants to cross reference some of the concepts that you've touched on, I think great supportive episodes are the inner child healing episode with Leah Mm -hmm. and we had Paul Selig on who um, will definitely provide specific things you can say to connect to that truth Mm -hmm. um, of identity. Well, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Allison. Thank you so much for what you do and who you are. You're just absolutely wonderful. I'm a big fan. and I I love the light that you're bringing to the world. Thank Thank you. you. No, it's it's mutual. So for everyone tuning in, if, if we return to the gardener and flower metaphor and apply it to our whole lives, we see that every action and choice and belief is a seed that grows something in our lives. It's kind of cause and effect, right? So during our times of coming together or parting, we want to plant seeds of conscious love and compassion. We want to release ourselves and the other to find greater freedom and fulfillment. We also get to see, as Catherine has showed us, separations are crossroads and we have the choice to either contract and become more fearful and afraid and stick to our story or we can expand and we can transform into that future beautiful self and of course attract the beautiful people who we want to surround ourselves with and redesign the world with so that's the kind of conscious love that i hope we um start developing and to paraphrase a quote that I read in in one of your books, we have to have more interest in being honest than in being right. And we have to have more interest in the development than in defending ourselves. Yes, pain and discomfort are inevitable. So I'm giving you a big old hug through the microphone right now, but they don't have to ruin us. We can manage our lives um, in this new way and find that healthy completion and healthy new beginnings. So now it's time to kick off our conscious love development with this week's mantras. I will say each twice and then you can repeat in the space uh, for the third and of course use it to reprogram your attitudes and um, spark new contemplation for the upcoming week. Okay, number one, I will be a lover and actively bring healthy love into this world. 
I will be a lover and actively bring healthy love into this world. Number two, my past doesn't define what's possible for me. I do, by the stand I take in this moment. My past doesn't define what's possible for me. I do, by the stand I take in this moment. And lastly, it's good to remember that where there is no light, I have the choice to become it. It's good to remember that where there is no light, I have the choice to become it. Amazing. Thank you everyone for listening. Please do share this with a few loved ones and uh, make sure you leave a review with your favorite takeaways from the episode so other folks know to check it out. And give yourself a big hug today just because I will see you next week for more Simplexity. It's anything but small talk. Peace.